more questions than you think is necessary, but I'm just trying to get yeah. um, this material can't. that we can, we can edit it later. Yeah. We'll take stuff out. But. Right. Okay, anytime. We're rolling. Okay. Um, let's start, let's warm up with just tell me uh, what uh, university you went to and uh, what were your academic training? Yeah, well, I went to University of Illinois and uh, took ceramic engineering uh, because I thought I was going to go in the brick business. By the time I got out of school, well, there wasn't any brick business anymore. The price of taking care of that. And I had an opportunity to go with Owens, Owens Illinois, so I certainly grabbed it, I'll tell you. There weren't many jobs around that time. What was the first job you had uh, with Owens Illinois? I was in a trainee course and uh, had a job of packing bottles and uh, I put on a line and work on a line for about eight hours a day. And these bottles come down on a conveyor and you take them off and put them in a you know, cardboard carton and uh, got a little tiresome at times, I'll tell you. <laughs> and uh, so actually the but the second day I was there, uh, somebody came by the conveyor line and said, Mr. Levis would like to see you after, after you're through work. Didn't say go up now and see the boss, but <clears throat> after you're through work, why go up and see him? Which I did, and he said, I don't have been there a couple of days, and he said, well, it's been nice to have you. You're being transferred to Evansville, Indiana, and uh, Go over to the third desk, and the man will give you your travel money and your ticket, and uh, hope you hope you get along well. And goodbye. So that was, <laughs> I was uh, on my way to the research department of Owens, Illinois. <clears throat> Where was that factory that you were? In Evansville, Indiana. In Alton originally, Alton, Illinois. Alton, Illinois, and then you were transferred to, to Evansville, Indiana. Yeah. Okay, let's stop just one second. I wonder if uh, I get a glass of water. Okay. Um, so that was the training program. Uh, that was the end of the training program. That was the end of your training program. Yeah, all right. Because we'd started. We were starting a research department. Uh, in uh, I was, Evans? Yeah, Evansville. So, I was. What did you find when you got there? Well, they uh, had a bottle plant, and uh, they were they were set up to make. Uh, some fiber. They were making some real coarse fiber that they'd started to make. And our first product they decided would be an air filter. Those time air fillers were big heavy pieces of metal, expanded metal. They'd soak them and when they were dirty well, they'd boil them out. And uh, a desktop filler that we've developed came out, came out for 75 cents where the uh, metal ones cost $30. So we got pretty good acceptance pretty quick, and uh, so we were we were on our way. We had one product, and we played it for all it was worth. That um, that plant they were already making some coarse fibers when you got there. Yeah, well they they <clears throat> had a couple of engineers go down and rig up a furnace so they could pull some some coarse fiber and make these uh, fillers that they were going to produce. Mm -hmm. How did they form the fibers? We'll just put a, a hole in a bushing or a hole in an outlet and catch any time you pull a piece of glass you get a fiber eventually. So they just catch a piece of glass and start putting it on a roller and wind it up. Or just coarse fiber. Mm -hmm. Then they take it off and take it off. Cut it then. off and scrunch it around, put some binder on it so it'll stay in place and then put some adhesive to uh, uh, contact and take the dust out of the air. And when that filled up and there was all used up with all the wetting power of the adhesive, well, then the filler had to be changed. Mm -hmm. But that life was about as good as the life in the, the $30 compared with $1 dust stop. So it had a real advantage cost-wise which made them very popular right away. And what was your job when you first went to that plant <clears throat> in Evansville? Well, there wasn't anybody there in the research but me, and my job was, was everything that 
that came along. We had to make the fibers and make the, the uh, fillers. We made those in a cardboard box with a perforated surface to let the air through. And uh, <coughs> then we'd, we'd box those up and put the adhesive on and ship them out to our customers. Um, you, we've talked, you've mentioned before an experiment with the glass block that uh, Dale Kleist was involved with. Um, well, that was <coughs> good. That was a good deal later. Uh, we were in uh, Columbus by then, and uh, uh, one of the other things in our research department, not in where we were, but uh, in the glass part of the business, solid glass, they were making some glass blocks, which were, they just pressed a glass block, or like a glass dish, and, uh, and they had a flat piece they'd seal on the top. And we, they were putting that on with the, uh, rosin or anything that would kind of stick them together. And when they'd put them out on the job in the air, in the heat, where well, the rosin would re melt and the air would expand and then they'd blow little bubbles out of the, where the contact of the lid and the and the uh, block uh, which they'd go along and knock off with a, a fishing rod a fishing pole and uh, so that wasn't very satisfactory so then they were decided they were going to seal them with uh, hot molten glass so that was the original idea that you'd blow some hot glass at this joint of the, of the uh, uh, block and the lid and seal it on a kind of permanent basis. Uh, but the problem was that when we decided to spray it with a metal layer gun, which would, which usually sprayed metal, but uh, we rigged it up so it was pretty glass, uh, instead of spraying onto the block and sealing it, why it, the glass fibers were formed, blew out into the air, very, very fine fiber. And up to that time, we'd been making very coarse fiber pull them direct from the furnace and on the you know, conveyor and uh, or gather them on a roller of some kind. So at least we immediately realized we had the basis for a fine fiber that would have many, many applications. It wouldn't be, so, be as coarse and hard to handle and, and difficult to, to live with, you know. So that, that really uh, was the first time that we realized we could make really fine fiber. We always before felt we had limitations. Now we realize we had no limitations. We could go any place we wanted as fast as we wanted. Dale Kleist was the guy that was working on that uh, on that project in the lab. Yeah, yeah. We had a very small group of people doing research, and Dale was setting up the machinery to do it. And first, we tried to do it with using the ground glass and sprinkling it into an in intake into this gun. Uh, but that was that messed up and wouldn't, wouldn't work. Just threw chunks of stuff. So then we decided we'd uh, try glass rods. So we pulled rods, round them up on big creels, and fed those into the metal air gun, and we got this very fine fiber, which uh, changed our whole approach to what we could do with glass, I'll tell you. Did, did Dale know? Uh that he uh, found a new way to make glass fibers, or was he annoyed that his glass block project? Well, he, wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't accomplishing what he thought, but <laughs> but everybody <laughs> you know, pretty quickly got him around to thinking right on it. Well, I forgot all about the sealing glass blocks, I'll tell you. We can go, he can go back to trying it again. Did you, uh, did you come in and find him working on these things, making the fibers? Well, I'd, I'd been kind of uh, working with him and when the, the powder glass wouldn't work, why well, we said, well, why don't we try to make some glass rods and feeding those in, which is just like feeding the metal in. And uh, so we pulled those rods. It was kind of a joint thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, um, so you didn't get what you were looking for, but you found something else. Exactly right, you bet. Okay. Um, what uh, what was the reaction at the at the time? Do you recall what it was? Like? <clears throat> well, we, of course, Slater was the boss. He was happened to be there that day, so 
uh, we went in and talked to him about it. He was very excited, got a hold of Toledo and explained all this to Toledo. Who was, you know, they were looking for something to happen because a lot of things are going on, but they weren't going very fast, you know. And this was a real shot in the arm to everybody in the little group we had. Toledo and Newark and every place else. So you knew pretty pretty quickly that you had uh, a winner. Oh sure, and, and it all influenced everything we were thinking at the time, uh, because we knew we could do this, and now it was a matter of mechanizing it and you know where we could do it in production and quantity, as against just having a little handful of fiber. Mm -hmm. And it, it really was kind of the kickoff to to really something solid. Uh, to home insulation and all these other places that uh, uh, we needed a material we could handle better. We used to early insulation while we'd wrap it in paper so that people could, could handle it and wouldn't be hard on your hands and difficult to, to put it in the refrigerator or in a home or wherever. And before, uh, when you first started at uh, Heavensville it was? Right. Uh, and you were making some fibers for filters. Is yep. that basically all the glass fiber work you did until that block, <clears throat> block experiment? Or? Yeah, fire. we did some work on foams. We thought maybe we could make some glass foam. Foams were just kind of coming in. So we said, why don't we make them out of glass? Well, the problem was we, our approach was we'd do it with a vacuum chamber. We'd put the hot molten glass gob into a vacuum chamber and then pull the vacuum and and the air would expand inside the, the glass and make a foam. Well, the problem was we ended up with just a great big block of covering the inside of the, of the foam chamber, or the uh, uh, vacuum chamber, and uh, no foam at all. So we pretty quickly got over that. But during that experiment, we uh, thought we ought to do that with an electric furnace. So we got a big electric furnace and put it in there. And on a, as an economy, while we did all our work at night or on weekends when the power charge was down low. Uh, and then we hauled that furnace around with us to Columbus and Newark and all over the country trying to do something with it. The foam was going to be an insulation material? Yeah, okay. just like foam is today. You know, it's what you'd see on these houses around here. That, they got a little blue streak, that's a, a polyester or some other foam, mm -hmm. organic foam of some kind. So, um, what was the, why was the big push? What were you trying to do, uh, find new things to make with glass? <clears throat> well, everything, all that was being made was window glass and bottles and, and automobile glass, all solid materials made of glass and limited in their applications, of course. And uh, so we tried everything that there was that we could possibly think of making. Uh, and this one, glass block being one, if uh, it was good for bottles, why wasn't it good for building houses, you know, approach. And uh, so you know, what we really were looking for was something that we could, that we could really push and and we found we could on a filter. Filler was a, was a popular thing. And people didn't use them because they're just too expensive and too hard to handle. So it gave us a kickoff. And then, of course, insulation, uh, when we made a little, fine, a little finer fiber, was a, was a natural. And as today, it really dominated everything we did. Home building and refrigeration and all these places that needed some way to control their heat losses. And uh, we kind of filled that gap. What was the glass business like back in those days when you <clears throat> first joined Owens Online? Well, glass business had been hit hard by prohibition. Of course, there was no whiskey bottles, no beer bottles, no nothing. And uh, so they, they, it was a, there weren't too many people in it. Or the people in it were small companies mostly. And the uh, people like Owens, Illinois, who was the Owens bottle company in, in Alton, Illinois, came to Toledo and 
farm to Owens, Owens Illinois with Owens Glass Company. And uh, so the Alton Glass and Owens Illinois farm was farmed. Uh, but it was a kind of a one, one product business as far as the bottle people were concerned. They didn't make anything else out of it except bottles. And, uh, and there was a thing that uh, the automatic bottle machine had come in and it was an economical process and the, the economical thing to do was to make containers out of glass. And, uh, but they thought, well, there must be something more we can do than this. And uh, so that was the reason for the uh, original experiments and setting up this department or laboratory to, to make things out of glass other than bottles. Of course, when prohibition uh, was over, why they, then the bottle business really flourished. They were back at it again. And uh, what, what was the impact of the Depression on, uh, on that time? <laughs> Well, an awful lot of uh, small glass companies, uh, as many as many businesses, kind of took it on the chin. The uh, uh, there weren't there weren't lots of places you could go where you could sell glass. You know, you could make bottles out of it. Why well, fine? You could make plate glass out of it or window glass, whatever. But it. Uh, It was a kind of a limited one man kind of business. And there were lots of little, it was easy business to get into. You could get a, a blow pipe and a, some hot glass and you could make a bottle. Uh, so the things that they were concentrating on were mechanization, automatic machines for making bottles, <clears throat> and automatic uh, uh, handling through leers to, so that you could uh, uh, get it to market without it uh, deteriorating. Like, and of course glass, as you probably know, is uh, has to be annealed. And we had the big long annealing ovens that uh, all the bottles had to be put through and heated and then cooled slowly so that they wouldn't be very brittle and, and break so easily. So there were lots of things going on to improve the, the quality of bottles, but not many places you could go to do something else with it, you know. So that's what uh, this whole project you were involved in was all about, was finding other Right, some place to go with other places to sell glass. Mm -hmm. Okay, and who were some of the people uh, back then? Uh, you mentioned Slater, who was that? Well, <clears throat> uh, Slater was a um, chemical engineer from Purdue, and uh, he had a uh, contract with Owens at that end. Uh, uh, his job was to find better methods of making mold uh, iron that would be better for farming the bottles and and he was working on that phase of it and he was down at Alton which is a known alloy plant walking through and then out of a what they call a, a glory hole or a, a sting out area if there was any glass that melted on the side and went down, then when the sting out would hit it, or flame still shooting out would hit it, why it would pull a fiber. And there was a little pile of these fibers on the floor, and Slater saw them and said, geez, we must be able to do something with these. And that was the original uh, move on making the fillers, and that's the reason they went to Evansville and made a few fibers uh, to make these first fillers. But then they gave Slater a con contract, to, you know, a free hand to go to what you can do to, to uh, make things out of glass. And of course, everybody who got involved with it was, they wanted to be a part of it one way or another. So uh, they sent it on down to Evansville so it wouldn't be right in the, everybody's bailiwick. And uh, then we, uh, <clears throat> We started to had people, we added one man while we were still in Evansville, a fellow named Simpson, who was a, uh, a mechanical engineer from Illinois. And uh, then when we got to Columbus, why, uh, Ben Boyd joined us. And uh, 
uh, I about that time I went back to Illinois and uh, and uh, uh, had, a, had a meeting with the ceramic people and they had a fellow there by the name of Faye Tooley who was a glass chemist and he was writing a paper on uh, how to make uh, fiber and insulation out of rock wool where you just dug up the rock and put it through a cupola and melted it and when it hot molten the rock came out the spout while you hit it with a blast of air and it made fiber. Can and we stop, excuse me, can we stop right here? I need to change the tape. Okay. <coughs> Good. It's my sideline. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Sure. So they were already uh, in the habit of doing business outside. And, uh, well, this was kind of a logical move. Mm -hmm. Good. They eliminated some of the stuff that wasn't that profitable for them. Uh, uh, artwork, mechanical artwork uh, yep. for printing, you know, which wasn't very profitable, they got rid of that and they... Well, they must have been doing a lot of in-house things that weren't very profitable anyway, mm -hmm. right? We're right. set anytime. Yeah. And we are rolling, so anytime. Good. Okay. Well, we were talking about Fay Tooley. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got a hold of Slater on the phone and I said, this, this guy's going to put everybody in the state of Illinois in, a, in the insulation business. Slater said, well, hire him, hire him, bring him home. <laughs> Bring him home with you. <laughs> uh, kind of a funny incident on that. Mrs. Thomas, I guess I went out to play golf on a Sunday morning when he was supposed to come to, to Newark. And uh, so I asked her if she'd go down and meet him at the station. That's what she agreed to do. And Newark wasn't a very busy place on Sunday morning, you might expect. But he came in, and he was dressed in dungarees and kind of an old blue shirt. and. Uh, he knew damn well at who Mrs. Thomas was. She was standing there. And so he kind of went over in the car and just kind of stood there. And she waited and everybody finally got off the train and left and she was standing around. Here's this bum over in the corner. <laughs> so finally she she got enough nerve to go over and say, are you Faye Tooley? <laughs> Turns out he was. But uh, she doesn't have even today a very warm spot for Faye Tooley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a good, good glass guy, but <laughs> didn't make much of a hit with our bride. And during that period, we added a few people. We added a fellow named Al Simison, uh, who was a good chemist and stayed in the fiberglass business till he retired and died. And uh, of course, Boyd and this uh, Charlie Simpson we had. And uh, we added a few people, but when these other things started to break, like we see we can make fine fiber in our, uh, and places to go in other markets, that the fiber would fit. But then we just kind of added people and if anything that came along, we'd work on it. And it was a very freewheeling, uh, well-organized uh, mess, you know? Everybody doing what they kind of what they wanted to do but they were hard workers and, and some pretty intelligent guys and some good things came out of it. Uh, one of the big things, of course, we got uh, U.S. gypsum to take on a uh, house insulation. And they were big into the art today, big in the building materials field. And they did a, did a fine job of introducing it. And uh, so we we're kind of on our way. And everybody was, uh, we talked with it was interesting to do something with it, kind of like the uh, the uh, equipment business. And uh, if you went and talked to somebody like GE or Westinghouse or any of these people that were making refrigerators and all, they were glad to see you and wanted to test your material. And you had got tremendous cooperation uh, in the field. And it was kind of a the latest thing, you know. Where and uh, so we kind of went from there. Um, 
you were describing a few minutes ago the time my game Slater was walking through the plant and saw those you know, first glass fibers and said, yeah. we have to be able to yeah. do something with these. That's kind of a pivotal part in the history of the company, isn't it? Is that, if you had to it's trace really, it to the earliest moments? Oh, it certainly was, yeah, as far as fiberglass is concerned, right. Mm -hmm. No question about it, yeah. yeah. Tell me again how the fibers were formed. <clears throat> well, have you seen a glass furnace? Yes. <clears throat> Any place that the, uh, it, it's, of course it's a great big box uh, being heated with, either with gas or now that a lot of us are electric. But this gas would flow over the surface and melt the glass. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and there had to be places where the uh, pressure could be relieved and get out. So there would be holes in, along the furnace at the right above the glass line. And uh, when the batch was put into the furnace, some of it would hit on the ceiling and all would melt down and run down and would drip past these holes. And when it did, why then the flame was shooting out the side of the furnace would hit this glass and extend it into a fiber. And that's what would pile up outside, just a small pile of stuff. But enough for the guy with a fertile brain like Slater could see lots of things you could do with that. Great. Okay, so so that was one of the, the pivotal moments uh, when Slater <clears throat> saw the fibers and saw we, there must be things we could do with that. And then maybe the other one was that time, that glass block experiment where you decided you could make them in large quantities? Yeah. You could make the fiber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, are you, the fineness. But it was really very fine, very, I mean, easy to handle. In fact, my wife started knitting it for people uh, at their request, not at hers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, those early days you mentioned, uh, we started talking about that just a second ago, where <clears throat> you wanted, you'd go call on equipment manufacturers and you talk to USG. Um, was there a sales force in those days, or was it the guys in the lab that were out pushing the product? Well, uh, you got to remember the times were such that there were lots of people looking for jobs, and we and we went along. We accumulated a number of salespeople in the field, and we, we got some very fine people, people that had run their own business, and something had happened; they'd gone broke or something. So we had older people in the sales department were operating these branch areas. Uh, and uh, we had a guy by the name of Jan Urban who was in New York and a fellow by the name of Winterhaller who was in uh, Los Angeles and the gal on the West Coast. Uh, every place we had a good top businessman running the, the branch sales office and selling fillers and, and insulation for home insulation and, and there was an awful lot of promotion. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, we weren't really set up to do this selling job ourselves. And uh, so we backed up a USG in the field with people doing promotion. <clears throat> we spent a lot of time with the equipment manufacturers uh, promoting their products. <clears throat> and we promoted, of course, fillers. We had a filler distributors finally all over the country. So it was a, a lot of promotion but where we weren't really selling direct. We were promoting the products of our customers and their markets. Okay, you want to take that? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, but... Uh, okay, what was the strategy for marketing uh, you know, fiberglass materials? How did you decide uh, you were going to go about selling it? <coughs> Well, we had to get you had to get wide coverage as we could, which is the reason we took on a uh, an exclusive home building material company, uh, USG, US, uh, and they uh, they had good coverage and good sales there effort, and we got immediate outlets all over the country. Uh, as far as equipment manufacturers, we'd Frigidaire and people like that, we called on them direct and and we would take their models, take them into the plant, and we'd cut the insulation to fit. 
so that when they got a bundle of insulation, why you had the floor and the backs and the sides and the ceilings and the doors, just pushed them in place and that was it, which made it, it made it easy for the the equipment manufacturers because before that they'd been taking paper or whatever to, for insulation and stuffing it in place and and uh, hoping for the best and uh, so you you had service along with the product and it made made it pretty easy for them people to buy it and use it and made it you know, that's to perform a service of over and above just selling a bag of insulation and it worked out very well and we sold all of course all the equipment and appliance people uh, for their stoves and refrigerators, wherever they were using insulation of any kind. What was the competition in those days? Who were you competing <coughs> against? Well, there was, there was rock wool, of course, and a lot of people used that. And the real problem with rock wool was that it was a blown process, and any time you blow blue glass, you blow a little bead with a tail on it, and the tail is the fiber, and the bead is is waste really and they would blow it out into a big room and the beads which were heavier would go the farthest and the fibers that got finer and they made it got down to find it finally pulled apart would be closer to the, where you were farming it uh, the material where the heavy, far end would maybe weigh 50 pounds a cubic foot and back towards the where the finer and better fiber was maybe that would be about 20 pounds cubic foot. And of course when we started to make these, they weren't real fine, but finer fibers, <coughs> uh, our material for house insulation or these other applications <coughs> was down around a little pound and a half, two pounds a cubic foot. So that was a real advantage to, to uh, use it because of lower cost and, and the weight. Why was it lower cost? Because of a less batch <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, you, sure, the rock didn't cost much, but uh, you had had a 20 to 1 advantage weight-wise. <clears throat> what you had to use in the way of material, why was, that was pretty substantial. And, uh, and it was intriguing. I mean, people were kind of enhanced with the idea that here was something new, you know. And this is the bottom of the Depression. There wasn't anything very new. I mean, mostly it was, it was how tough things were, you know. And it was really a, a great uh, <clears throat> move on the part of Corning and Owens, Illinois, to, to go out and develop this area. And uh, of course, it started out with individual uh, research and individual sales and, in, and each company doing their own. <clears throat> Then they finally decided, well, this is foolish, so they, the research got to be a kind of a joint thing. Uh, everything but sales, manufacturing, everything was joint development. Then they, the Hills Department was competitive. And uh, that seemed kind of silly, too. So they went together and put up the dough to farm owns Harding. <coughs> and originally, the directors came, <coughs> excuse me. Directors half came from uh, Owens Illinois and half, um, half came from Carning, and they were good top people, presidents of both companies, and, and the top officers. And uh, Carning had done a lot of good work in research. I mean, they developed these eyeglasses, for instance, that change color with the when exposed to the to the light. Uh, they, of course, did all the work on real fine glassware, tube M. Uh, they developed top of the stoveware, which was glass that would take the shock of you heat it on a, on a hot open burner. Uh, so they had been and still are strong in research. And uh, so when they put the two companies, put this thing together, why it was well backed and, and uh, had, of course, it got good management. Management all really came from 
from Owens, Illinois. Corning was mostly research people, and they kind of stayed to that. That was kind of their bailiwick. Uh, and of course, they brought Bessenstein in, who was one of the top people at Owens. And uh, he was in charge, and he had the money, and away they went. Uh, we talked about that uh, time when Slater found the fibers, and we talked about the time when you and Dale were working on the block project. Those are Owens, Illinois projects. Is there anything comparable on the on the Corning side? Any breakthroughs? Not that break, not that went directly to fiberglass. Uh, they did. What were some of the early research contributions that they made? Of uh, Corning. Corning. Right? <coughs> well, they, <coughs> excuse me. They they didn't they were never very active in the in the operations. Uh, like they that's one of the reasons they were glad to farm it because it, uh, I'm gonna get rid of this. I trust you can cut all this stuff out. Sure. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, Corning's contribution. Well. That was one of the problems. They they had things that they wanted to make out of glass that were uh, well engineered and highly engineered and that's top of the stoveware and those kind of things were. And of course they made a lot of tubing and those kind of things. Uh, so they weren't really interested in in the uh, they were interested in the company doing well and but they weren't interested in moving into the research end of the thing. And although they were half the members of the board were there, or from Carning, the uh, owns, owns the Illinois people, uh, and I guess majorly because the company was here around, uh, it really was a owns Illinois development. Okay, but uh, Corning put up half the money, and uh, yeah, so right. Some people, the winter, some people that joined the yeah, they bought a few, but. Uh, uh, the active people in the business were Zimmerman and Slater and and people like that. Mm -hmm. They sent one man, a fellow by the name of Gregory, George Gregory, who was a sales guy. Uh, and, but actually, that was about all that came from Carning. Have they made any fibers or any products with glass fiber? Oh, they've done some, they're doing research work and specialized fiber, carbon fiber and things like that. But. Uh, they, they've had no uh, actual input as far as fiberglass is concerned. They've had these other things that they were more to their liking and highly technical, and, mm -hmm. and that's where their expertise is. Mm -hmm. And of course, they've done very well. Okay, yeah. What about bushing technology? Do they have anything to do with that? <clears throat> no, not really, because the bushing technology at the time was pretty uh, minimal, and they didn't do any further work on it. They weren't interested in that end of it. Yeah. But of course, the, once the uh, you demonstrated that you could make fine fiber, uh, then there was a tremendous amount of work on uh, methods of blowing with the steam, what you did it with air, uh, what you did with the the bushings and all. See, the, one of the real problems originally was the in fact, that glass flowing through the refractory, hot glass, would kind of wear away or melt and take into solution the, the refractory itself. So you'd start with, a, let's say, a hole as big as your, under your little finger, uh, in a matter of a minute spreading there, or I wouldn't, literally a couple of several hours, but that hole had enlarged to where you had a much bigger stream of glass coming down. Of course, when you hit that with hot steam and blew it into fiber, the fine, finer the stream, why the finer the fiber you get. So you get a kind of constant changing condition. Uh, refractor was wearing all the time, or you were changing bushings and all those. Uh, so we decided we'd have a look at uh, precious metals. And uh, I was given the assignment of going over to high estate and talking with their ceramic people. And they'd done a little work on uh, making crucibles out of uh, platinum. And uh, 
even there they had problems because platinum by itself is pretty soft material. And if they had a little crucible or something with the glass flowing through it, well, it would slowly elongate and the fiber would get coarser as the hole got greater. And, and so they, <clears throat> we decided we'd go talk to the people who knew something about precious metals. <clears throat> and so we talked to, to Bishop and Baker, two different platinum companies. But most of our work was done with Baker Platinum. And we started with 100% platinum and 0% rhodium, and then we went to 100% to rhodium and zero platinum, a combination of all these alloys. And then we made bushings and methods of testing. And uh, we, when they were very, very helpful, of course, they were going to sell platinum. And <laughs> we, we wanted to help, and they were very helpful. They made all these different alloys and we'd take them and they'd give it to us in sheets and then we'd farm those sheets into bushings and orifices and where we could put them in the furnace and pull the fiber. And at the, at the end we ended up, I guess, with I'm still proud of that way, about 90% platinum, 10% rhodium. Rhodium gave it stiffness and hardness and platinum gave it temperature characteristics. And uh, the idea, so what we would do is take the bushings that we, they farmed them, and because they had some techniques in metal working and, and with oxygen, hydrogen flames that were very high temperature and allowed you to met, we tried originally what they, they used to uh, put platinum together by ham, putting two layers together and hitting it with a hammer, peen hammer. And, uh, it would, it would kind of farm, but not fuse. And so we thought maybe we could do it that way, and we made a number of things out of uh, where we just farmed them by pounding together. And... Uh, stop you right here again, we've got to change tapes. And oh. Uh, regarding the platinum rhodium use for our bushings, uh, originally a lot of people did what they call tap welding. That's where you you made a joint, two pieces of metal, and then you tap tapped it with a peen hammer, and it would stick together. And for most kind of applications, that was pretty good. But with the glass, with the temperatures we operated. Uh, the glass would just go right underneath one layer and go out the side so that tap welding it out. We had to learn how to weld big pieces with the oxyhydrogen flames. And uh, a fellow by the name of Fletcher, who was an expert mechanic, that kind of took this as a challenge that he would perfect the welding in big pieces of platinum. Because these were big bushings and big chunks and had to lay heavy pieces of metal on where you wanted to distribute the uh, current and temperatures. And uh, the problem with the oxyhydrogen flame is that it's so high temperature, so intense, that if you're working on a bench, can I use my hands now? Sure. On a bench, uh, and you had a piece of metal you were working on here, and you reached over and got another piece, and, to put it there and you moved your torch across your hand or across your, without realizing it, across your arm or something, you just burn a hole right through your shirt or whatever's there and into your skin and it took literally months for it to heal up. And it was so difficult to heal that you would just, if you burnt your hands, why well, you'd bandage them and then soak them in uh, just something to, to relieve the, the intense pain of this and it would take weeks to heal. And uh, this guy Fletcher, getting around to where he was careful enough not to do it, he burned his hand in something terrible. And Dale Kleist decided he wanted to do a little uh, of this too. So he burned his the hell out of himself 
with doing this. And I remember one New Year's Eve, we were at home. Guys came busting out and over, and his hands were just bothering, hurting him so damn bad he couldn't sleep or sit or do anything. He couldn't find a doctor, and so we hustled around town. Newark's not a very big place. I got a doctor to take a look and see what he could do about it. And gave him a little relief. But it finally got around to where it was pretty routine, and, and we used thousands and thousands of ounces of platinum, all of which you lost a little, but you always could melt it up again and make sheets out of it and roll it and, and start to weld it again. Let's talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> a couple of the key people um, in the early history of the company, James Slater and Harold Beschenstein. <clears throat> well, these guys all came from Alton, Beschenstein and Levis and Bernard, who was one of the vice presidents uh, and one of the early sponsors of, of <coughs> doing this development work, <clears throat> and of course many others. But uh, uh, Beschenstein and, uh, and uh, Levis were very close. And uh, uh, Beshantyn, of course, was young, and he was out on various assignments. I think at one time he was running their uh, chemical and their uh, pharmaceutical mm -hmm. division, or areas where they worked in pharmaceutical, with pharmaceutical people, uh, and which used a lot of bottles and was a pretty important phase of their business, you know. and. Uh, so when it came time to pick somebody to, to, of course, I had to give up whatever they were doing at Owens, Illinois, and come over to this new company. Why well, they picked Beschenstein, and it was a really a great uh, choice, actually. Uh, I'm often said that if it wasn't, hadn't been a Beschenstein, it had never been a fiberglass. Uh, by the same token, I felt that same way about Slater who just bubbled with ideas. He had all kinds of ideas. And if he couldn't do it one way, he had some idea how you could do it some other way, you know, one of those kind of guys. And between the two of them, they were a great foundation for a business. And it's gone solidly since, even though both of them are gone. Uh, and I'd say those two key people kept the business rolling. Uh, and they had the confidence of the uh, management of Owens, Illinois, so that there wasn't any question about them getting the money they needed, whatever funds they had to have, what they could get. And uh, and nobody really looked over their shoulder and said, well, what are you doing that for, you know? Which would have been, of course, suicide for a research group. You had a lot of outsiders and kind of snooping around. So those two key people, two key people were by and large, the greatest. Of course, there were some other original people. There was Zimmerman, who was a manufacturing guy and uh, who was a good, great people's guy. And um, he, Boyd came to, to uh, Fiberglass while Zimmerman kind of took him under his wing and developed him from the manufacturing end. So it uh, had a good group working well together. Uh, Beschenstein, of course, was boss and, and wanted to be boss and called the shots. And uh, Slater was a very hard guy to control. I mean, if he didn't tell you what he was going to do, but he'd go do it, you know. Uh, and uh, Beschenstein continually wanted to get him to Toledo from Newark, where he could kind of have him under his thumb rather than let him stay down there at Newark and do as he damn pleased. But that never worked. He could never get him up here from, from Newark. But, uh, but it, all in all, I mean, a good head-to-head -head confrontation isn't bad, you know? And you, and you had to prove what you were talking about when it got right down to it. And Slater could do that. And he, he had, he, of course, he had flights of fancy, a guy well, ideal guy will, and he got very interested in running farms and arson around doing that. Got had a side thing 
working on building homes, prefabs. Uh, in fact, he talked me into buying one, which I owned until I until it paid for itself, and then I sold it. But I bought it. I remember I bought the, uh, the house for a little less than six thousand dollars, and uh, well, a nice big lot and everything, and. Uh, Still depression and all, so the time to sell it. Well, I think I sold it for sixty-five hundred or something like that. But within a matter of a couple of weeks, why well, it had sold for something like twenty-eight thousand. But that was one of the problems of being moved all over the country. I never got around to long enough to stay long enough to make a hell of a lot of money on these houses that I owned. As I, I bought one each place I went, but then I'd have to. <laughs> Get rid of it some way or another. You know, we made it pretty good on the one we had on the West Coast, but uh, most of them we just made a few thousand bucks and that was it. Um, what was uh, Bessenstein's uh, strengths? What did he bring to the to the party? What was he really good at? Uh, well, I think it. I, yeah, I'd have to say that he was the kind of guy to keep his eye on the ball. You know, he didn't go off in all directions at once. Uh, he brought strong leadership. Not he wasn't a uh, warmer guy as you might have liked. Uh, I mean, he wasn't buddy buddy with people. Uh, uh, you knew who he was the boss. And uh, on the other hand, he, the we started something while we went through with it, you know. And uh, uh, of course, he, by the same token, he made. A lot of people kind of made him mad, you know. And he did that with Slater, and he did that with Zimmerman, and he, and everybody. Uh, he'd he'd have some idea, on, and he'd stay with it, come hell or high water, until it was accomplished. He was a good he was a good salesman, a good guy in the field. Uh, he made strong friends with the customers. Uh, and I, he just brought good sound business judgment to the. To the company, and with a lot of people doing research and all that, can get it pretty far off the track, if you can imagine. And I think that's one of the things that concerned him. And Slater was down there, kind of on his own, doing it. He said, "I'm pleased," <laughs> he didn't have any, any real leash on him that he could yank him back. Talk to me about Slater. What kind of guy was he as a as a person? <laughs> Well, James was a country boy, born over in Indiana someplace. Uh, went to Purdue. Uh, was a smart, good student, uh, and a good idea man. Uh, and I'm sure that he would have loved to have been president and, and call all the shots instead of just in his own bailiwick. And so any chance he got, he would go off on a tangent went off on this house building binge of his. Uh, went off on the farming binge, moved out and bought a couple of farms and lived on the farms and uh, studied how to run them and how to make them more productive. And, and he was interested in everything that was going on. Uh, on the other hand, he was a kind of a harder kind of a country boy. and. Uh, Full of enthusiasm, but uh, sometimes a little bit off the track. But uh, you know, you can't have that many ideas and not have some bum ones, you know. But he did it. He was important. It would never have been a fiberglass without him, you know, because none of these things you had to stay with them, even though you you knew damn well it wasn't going to work, or or you couldn't see how it would ever work. We did that when. In a lot of these developments, but uh, the thing was that if something finally happened that bailed you out, or you found another way to go or another route, so it was it was, uh, it was a great experience. Of course, I was in it from the day one to the till I retired, and I loved every minute of it. And they were wonderful, wonderful people. Uh. Talk about the combination of uh, of Slater and Bessenstein as the as the two key guys. Was it uh, 
Was it important that we had the two guys with the kind of personalities they had? Well, oh, I think so. Yeah, I mean, if they, you know, the one was a one was a scientist and a technical guy. Uh, uh, Bischstein, on the other hand, was a strictly business kind of a guy. You know, research didn't mean anything to him, and he didn't really try to understand what the hell was going on. Uh, but he knew that you still had to come out with a black figure at the bottom of the line, bottom of the page, and, and uh, so he stuck to that. And then we, we had a fellow by the name of Winkle, who was the money man of the business, who did a wonderful job. And uh, he I don't think he'd gone to high school even. And he and, and uh, Bessenstein used to kind of go head to head on things. But they, these were positive people, and they stood up for their their plans and whatever they thought was right. And uh, well, I know it's a it's kind of hard to see how the business would have gone without if you'd have taken anyone out, you know, would have left a quite a gap, big hole. So you had a, a technical guy with a lot of great ideas, and you had a businessman who was keeping his eye on the ball. Well, that's right. Who was, and and he was he was boss. Uh, and I'm sure Slater would have loved to have been been the boss, because he started all these things on the side that, where he could be the boss. Run, he used to run these farms, and, and he ran this uh, prefabricated housing development. And uh, where he was the boss, you know. So, uh, um, start out with the sort of wonder material that could do all these things, and yep. a couple of key guys that could uh, could could stay with it. You know, and, and there were <clears throat> two sides of that team. And money. There was money there. To, mm -hmm. if you wanted to do something, you had money to do it. Now, uh, was that easy getting that money? Wasn't it no, no, no. Depression? Well, when see, when these companies put up, a, they put up six million dollars a piece, and that was a, that was a kitty. And uh, all intents and purposes, Bechstein had control of that and and uh, and spent it, spent it, and giving people stock and, and using stock to get people to come with the company. Later, somewhat later, uh, all kind of incentives along the line that he controlled, really. Okay. Um, you mentioned the, that you enjoyed the, the people of Lone Scorning. Uh, how would you characterize the people that you've known in the, in the company through the years? Well, I, I guess you'd. More as good friends, you know. We, uh, we played with them and we worked with them and had our families with them and and they were all along the line. There was a close relationship. And uh, of course, I was transferred all over the country, so you just get acquainted one place and away you'd go to another, you know. But. Uh, no, I'd say that characterize them. Um, you were and a, and a, uh, without being close, Bechstein was very friendly, but he wasn't a buddy buddy with anybody in the company. Uh, if he was going to be a buddy buddy with somebody, he'd go uh, on a trip with Bechtel's or Bechtel Construction or somebody like that. They're big factors in the, in these industries, and uh, we got into the textile business, and uh, he got very close to some of the top people in the textile business. Uh, but he wasn't uh, he wasn't really buddy buddy with the people in fiberglass. Um. Your, one of your patents uh, is about a, about tire cord. You developed yep. tire cord. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, we there was a little tire company in the, in Newark, Ohio, 
work. Uh, I forget what they call it now, but uh, I knew one of the fellows out there pretty well, and so I said, "Why don't we make up some some tires? Fiberglass, pretty strong and doesn't rust, and all it has all these wonderful characteristics. Let's make some tires." So he he got the uh, people to make the tires out there, made a few of them, put them on cars, and. And they didn't last very long because it, it wasn't protected. Glass wasn't protected. It moved around and, and pinched on itself and, and it would bite itself. And it would finally the car would go and then the tire would go, of course. So we kind of kept that on the back burner trying once in a while. And uh, so then when we got our textile division laboratory going up in Ashton, Rhode Island. Well, we made that one of our major projects to develop the adhesives and the uh, coatings to keep the glass from braiding itself. And of course, the tire it moves constantly. And, uh, had it, uh, and we tried all the things we could try. And then we went down to a place in, in uh, uh, I go in the, there's a tire, little tire company there in the, in the, near our lab up there. So we just took over their testing department for a matter of several months. And and this was one of the things we could do. We needed, we wanted to test those things, so we just went out and rented this laboratory for thirty thousand dollars a month. Uh, and went in there with our people and developed a tire because they had the equipment to check it and test it and braid it and, and uh, find out what the life would be and all. And then we just tried all the different possibilities. And there was a guy by the name of Al Marzaki who uh, uh, kind of took this project as a challenge and finally developed the coatings and sizes that allowed it to be used as tire car and protect itself. And we'd get just as good a mileage as they get out of steel. And uh, so, but it just took some concentration and doing whatever you had to do to to find out. I mean, if you depend on somebody else to test it for you, well, you do it at their speed. This way, we just took over the lab and, and uh, did it at our speed. And it worked out great. When did you uh, first try to make a tire? What, what, when was that? Oh, early, way early. When we were... Hold on a second. I'm sorry, we need to change tape. Videotape? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance of getting that 3M for our kids? Sure. Yeah. yeah. What I plan on doing is when we're, uh, excuse me, when we're finished, I can put them all on uh, VH. Are we talking about the tire when we stop? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think when we stopped, we were just talking about. Uh, I was asking you when the when you first developed the tire. And yeah. How long it took to get it to market? Yeah, well, uh, it took maybe maybe 20 years or so to get it to market because we had these early failures and and then other things seemed more important and we went in other directions. Uh, but then when we had a, a lab at Ashton, Rhode Island, which is devoted to textiles. Well, then that was one of our major projects, and and we got this guy Marzaki who you know, wanted to do it and was dedicated to do it, and and spent really the major years of his active career developing this tire. And we did whatever it took to do it, road tested, laboratory tested, whatever, and finally we got it round to where it was a a global, well doable product. And I think eventually it would be important to use of fiberglass. But now the steel people are so damn strong and and steel was having so damn much suddenly they wouldn't let you couldn't take any markets away from them if they could help it. And so it, uh, and and we, we didn't keep the push on it, uh, you know, that you might expect for a market that big. Uh, we, we pushed like hell and then we kind of backed away. And I think that down the line, it's going to be a valuable use for fiberglass. Okay. 
um, were there lots of things, things like that through the years where you you run up against an obstacle and you didn't think you were ever going to get a get a product to market and you had to keep pushing away at it? Yeah, sure. There were a number of those things. The screening market, which I don't know anything about it now, but it was a big market for us for a while because it didn't have any rust and you didn't have any stretch and and you made a damn good screen and. Uh, that market was a tough one at first, you know. Everybody found things wrong with it, you know. Uh, roofing materials. We toyed with roofing for a long, long time until we really finally went to work on it. Only real work and up till a point was done on the West Coast. And they did a lot of work and they tested it and they, you know, burnt down houses and did all kinds of things, checking it out. Around we finally we had enough information and we really went into the shingle business, the roofing business. Uh, but there was a long, long period where everybody wanted we make roofing out of it, but never got around to really doing it, you know, or doing what the work required to get it done. Have there been times when people think, well, that's it, we've done everything we can do? Do you hear people say that? No, no, I don't. No, I, my personal feeling is that. The, just as many opportunities now as there were, and just a matter of getting getting to them, you know. Okay. Um, okay. Lots of uh, what? Um, well, for instance, now this is the other day a gal called me from Seattle, and she developed a. Uh, they used for it in artificial fingernails for ladies. And one of the, heard that I'd been part of the re, original research and all, wanted to come and see me and get my story, you know. Well, that's, <laughs> I'd never even thought of using it for fingernails. Or, oh, really? But uh, uh, apparently, I don't know whether they grind it up and put it in the liquid or what the hell they do, but there's something, at least she was enthusiastic about it. And uh, I think it's got lots of applications in protection for automotive control of well, like accidents that, you know, you, let's take a guy like this Minton or fiberglass guy. Here he's all banged up and she's banged up and must be some way of building a damn front end of a car so they can get protected. And, I mean, they were, this wasn't a, there wasn't a terrible accident. They just kind of ran into a train moving along slowly, you know. I can see when you put two cars together at 50 miles an hour, why? That's whether well, anything will ever stop that, I don't know. But, what do you think of this window uh, project? <clears throat> well, I haven't gotten into it enough to really know, but they must, they've tested it, and, mm -hmm. and I. There's some, of course, there's some good windows on the market today. I mean, these are all double glazed and and uh, Anderson windows, I think these are. But you know, they're, they're, instead of having two great big panels of glass, where well, you got two thin layers put right together, and you got all the heat saving you could possibly expect. Uh, so it's going to be how this works from a standpoint of stability and days and place and and after all, they, there's some windows you probably hear in 10, 12 years that need some work done on, you know? And that, I would think, would be the long waned opportunity to, uh, uh, I, I'm hopeful, but I haven't done enough about it to say. Mm -hmm. You were out uh, in Santa Clara not too long ago and you uh, yep. talked to the people and so forth. Uh, what were some of your impressions when you went, went in there and you met the people and you saw the equipment they have to work with today and computers? My, my, uh, my impression was really total shock. When the last time I'd been there several years ago with an active plant going strong, doing lots of business and had lots of programs underway and doing some interesting development work. That had all been cleared out consolidate someplace else, probably in Newark. And uh, 
uh, you have these tremendous big furnaces pumping out uh, insulation. That was all. That was all that they were doing. Uh, there, were, like, there were a few people that uh, had left during the uh, reorganization. Uh, they'd, uh, a couple that had been back on contract. Uh, well, they didn't have anybody they could possibly replace them with. Uh, so I think that really the thing that shocked me was instead of having a, a little individual plant operation on the West Coast doing their thing and enthusiastic and, and at least when I was there, it was a profitable business. Uh, but the whole approach had changed and it, it was just an insulation plant and in Santa Clara, you know, and uh, people were there doing their job. The plant was clean and everything was nice, but it wasn't really a very active plant with a research thing going. All it, that had all been consolidated back here someplace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, looking back and you know, all that we've done with Owens Corning and all that Owens Corning's done. Uh, uh, what what do you think uh, gives you the most satisfaction? What's what's the most satisfying in all, in, you know, in your career and the growth and development of Owens Corning for you? Well, I think the time we spent in New York, we were in New York for 10 years, and we uh, had a textile vision which we set up and, and uh, saw that mature and Got to be an important part of the business, uh, and the fact that you were running like it was your own business, and that was the, where the satisfaction came, I guess. And the same thing was true on the West Coast. Nobody came to the West Coast to see how you're doing or why you're doing it. Uh, quite a few of them came for the for the airplane ride, you know, but not, not many came out to see what was going on. So it's a, I guess the satisfaction comes from being able to run something and, and uh, if you do it right, why it works and and okay, go ahead, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. One other thing I think is to see people kind of grow and grow up and get old and retire is kind of part of life and. And we saw that with a lot of people, and it's, uh, you get some satisfaction out of their successes. The other thing that you got to remember that this business has started in the Depression. I mean, I went to work for 125 a month, and well, I don't think I got a raise for for a year. There's a guy running running the division then, a fellow by the name of. This is part of still Owens, Illinois. I've been there, Randy Bernard. After I'd been there about a year, I walked past him in the plant one day, and he said, well, how you get along? I said, oh, fine. He said, well, I've looked around. He said, I'm going to sprinkle a little more ink on your check, which was an encouraging thing. And when he got around to do it several months later, got a 15 buck a month raise, you know. Well, that had been a long year. Uh, of course, to compensate for that, things didn't cost very much, you know. In fact, they cost very little. And you could always find some place to do anything you wanted to do, regardless of whether you were making any money or not. Well, this corning's changed a lot of uh, things, you know. Now, today, a house, so you build a house, fiberglass is the integral part of the walls and the attic of the house. And yep. Cars have a lot of fiberglass reinforced plastic parts on it. Boats are all uh, yep. made with fiberglass virtually uh, today. Yep. And we yep. have shingles now uh, have right. fiberglass reinforcement in most of them. Sure. Do you, ever, do you ever think, do you ever marvel at uh, how much the Owens Corning has changed over the years? Oh, yeah, sure, of course. Had a uh, tremendous impact? It's, a, it's an entirely different feeling, you know? Instead of being a what what do you think you'll do next kind of an approach? It's kind of got to be old hats, you know? Make it out of fiberglass, or they're making it out of fiberglass. Uh, the automobile Carvette was a good example of that. I mean, with a lot of effort on our part of our people and 
Morrison set up the guy that built them. Well, you know, they took it as a challenge and they came out with a pretty good looking automobile. Hell of a lot different than it is today. I mean, they made it bigger and fatter and all those things. But it was a good looking automobile at first. Streamlined little car. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, General Motors put up a lot of Joe to do it, you know. People always uh, running around back in the early days saying, uh, why can't we make this out of fire? Oh, sure, everybody. Or what are they going to do next kind of a uh -huh. thing. We have some things that didn't work? Well, yeah, I guess you, there were probably lots of things that didn't work. But the things that were obvious, like fishing rods and boats and those things, they kind of did it themselves, you know. It was amazing that uh, how many people spent their own time and money and, and uh, in developing products, developing boats and fishing rods and things like that. And shotguns, uh, barrels, and a number of things, you know. Many of which have come and gone, actually, gone by the boards. Made, made a hell of a good shotgun barrel, you know. Hmm. And uh, uh, you are doing, I don't know whether you're doing a shooting or not, but there's a difference, there's a difference between a 20 gauge and a, and a 12 gauge, you know, the size of the barrel. Uh, but you can drop a 20 gauge shell down the barrel of a uh, 12 gauge. And that's always a problem if you're carrying shells in your pocket and you've got some 20s and some some 12s. If you get a a 12 a 20 gauge in a 12 gauge barrel, just drop it in without realizing, it, and throw put another shell in behind it and fire it. A steel barrel just splits full length, which could, could be a dangerous thing when you're holding a gun. You know, uh, you can put a one of the tests for a fiberglass barrel was you could drop a 20 gauge in a 12 gauge barrel and fire it and blew it out and that was no problem, no split, no anything. Strength was just that much greater than a normal steel barrel. But that wasn't enough to, because uh, the barrel was much lighter and the gun came out quicker and faster and people had to learn how to shoot again and it made a difference. But it, it was a hell of a good application and a good result, uh, but a poor, poor market because it's it's small and it uh, uh, it just didn't, didn't catch on, you know. I think same thing with tires. I think it got takes a lot of promotion to come up against the steel people and and get steel replaced. Steel and got the market, you know, full a little bit of cotton, I guess, still damn little. Mm -hmm. Used to all be cotton. It's probably more nylon today. Well, kind of yeah, but I think steel has pretty much taken it from nylon. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's much yeah. actual tires. You probably think steel sounds stronger than glass. Yeah, Is well. the problem, do you think? No, I, uh, of course steel has some other problems. It rusts and it, it gets out of you know, shape and, and all kinds of problems, but they've got the market and they've got the acceptance and it keeps right on going. What do you think of, uh, you know, what was just a germ of an idea, you know, they founded that the company uh, and here it is 50 years. That seemed like a, it's gone fast or, you know? Well, it's gone fast as far as I'm concerned because I'm kind of looking back at it, but I don't know how fast it seems to be going to people today. I don't know, I just wonder what, people are all, everybody's enthusiastic as hell about fiberglass as we went along, you know. We were, the customers were, the Competitors were, I mean, the competitors couldn't wait when they gave consent decree, gave them a chance to get in, and everybody got in just as quick by God as they could, you know. Johns Manville and Mundette Clark and all these other people. Uh, so that, uh, you know, let's, let's go kind of an approach. Libby owns Ford, started, and everybody took a license and went to work, you know. Pittsburgh Plate, and right across the board. So it was a, you know, it was a kind of a thing to do, you know. And if those guys are making money, why the hell can't we? And 
we're glass people, we know what's going on, kind of an approach. So, uh, so they did. Um, originally, when the company was formed, do you do you uh, have any recollection for the of the day that the company was formed? You know, back uh, October thirty first, nineteen thirty eight. Was that day special in any way? I don't think, not not that I remember particularly. That just happened to be the official day that the yeah was yeah filed. right yeah. You've been operating pretty much as an independent entity within Illinois. Yeah. Illinois right. Yeah. Before that. Okay. Um, what were uh, Owens Illinois and Corning like as, as owners? They owned all pretty much all the stock. Yeah. Originally, they owned it all. Right. Were they uh, were they like today's shareholders? Were they, were they looking for that? Well, for a long time, I don't think Carning did much for theirs. I don't think they they kind of hung on to it. Uh, of course, the part that Bessenstein got, he gave stock to a number of people, uh, and it was an important thing in employing people at the time because wages were low. Wages were very low, uh, not just in fiberglass, but throughout industry in general, you know. So it, uh, the fact that they had stock to pass out to people was important. And the stock did very well, you know. Uh, early, went, went up and up and did very well. Okay. You could uh, take a break here, change tapes. Okay. Okay.